Uh, but this week has been an extraordinary week, and I would even say this year has been an extraordinary year for us, uh, but even beyond us uh, to a certain degree, what God is doing. Uh, and I wanted to be able to grab as much time this morning as I can to be able to just speak into what is what God is doing here and what he's doing around our nation. You know, on the day of Pentecost, when they were gathered together, and by the way, Toby, Pastor Toby preached a phenomenal message last weekend out of Acts chapter 2. Uh, we love Pastor Toby. And uh, his message out of Acts 2.42, just on the lifestyle of the community and what fellowship really is. It's powerful, but that was, that was the reaction that was the response of the church after Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when God poured his spirit out on the church, filled the place where they were gathered together in the upper room with the Holy Spirit, with wind and fire. And they all began to speak in tongues and prophesy, and it drew attention. And so when people gathered around wanting an explanation, you know, are these people drunk? What's going on with them? It was Peter, <coughs> excuse me, it was Peter's responsibility to stand up and say, this is what that is. This is that which was prophesied by Joel. This is what it is, and this is what it means, and here is how we need to respond to it. And I feel like I'm in a very similar position this morning as a pastor of Radiant, but also just as a, a leader and a voice in the body of Christ, because I, I feel like we're in an Acts 2 type of a moment, and uh, I, obviously I mean that here at Radiant and in our city but it's far bigger than that. It's far greater than that. You know, for many, many years, probably since the beginning of the, the times where I began to serve in ministry, one of the messages that God's called me to carry is a call to the church to pray and to contend for revival or for awakening in the church, especially in the American church. This is a message, I mean, this is a theme that I have I can't tell you how many sermons I've preached. If you've been around Radiant, you know it comes up over and over and over again because it's one of the responsibilities that God has given to me to carry. And uh, we are living right now in a prophetic moment where the things that we've prayed for for many, many years are in small measure beginning to break out in our nation and in the midst of this generation. We're beginning, it's like when you're driving your car and there's a little bit of sprinkle, a little bit of spit that shows up on your windshield. You're just like, hey, is it raining? And you run the wipers and you're just like, yep, sure enough, it's starting to rain. And you can see up ahead, the clouds getting you know heavier and ready to dump the rain. And you know what's coming. And we're in that moment right now where there's spit on the windshield. Um, Jane and I were on vacation in Mexico. We, we took a, a little vacation went down there and did a whole bunch of nothing. And uh, we, we got there on Monday night, Tuesday morning, we sat by the pool. Wednesday morning, my Twitter feed started blowing up with reports of something taking place at a college, a Christian college in Wilmore, Kentucky. A college called Asbury College that was founded by the, the Holiness uh, Wesleyan tradition and a college that has a history of revivals. In the last hundred years, Asbury has hosted five significant revivals, the last one of them being in 1970. And why Asbury is significant, it's not a big college, but it's significant because if you go back over revival history in America in the last hundred years, every time that there has been a significant outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Asbury, it's been a bellwether signpost of what is about to happen across the rest of the nation. In fact, in 1970, when Asbury started a prayer service and it went for over a week solid, on the heels of that exploded the Jesus people revival where hippies and people on the West Coast began to get saved and flood into the church, and it made the cover of Time Magazine. But the bellwether of that was Asbury. If you go back during the evangelical student awakenings of the 40s and 50s, Asbury, 1905, Asbury. And so last Wednesday, almost two weeks now, 
A young man stood up in their chapel, which is required three times a week to go to, and he ended his service basically calling the student body to a place of holiness, and as he walked off the stage, he thought it was over, but it still is going at this moment. A week and a half later. Got a couple pictures up here. I think if they can pop up here, just for those of you who are on. This is, this is Hughes Auditorium, and uh, this is one of the services in the middle of the day uh, that is taking place, and it's being completely led by Gen Z. A generation that this world has given up hope on, has thought, has moved on beyond Christianity, is more evolved. They've got, you know, there all kinds of other interests. And every article that you've read about has, you know, the church seen its best days. Has Gen Z finally put an end to our need for spirituality? Gen Z has everything. Gen Z doesn't need anything. Gen Z is spiritually bankrupt. Gen Z is hungry for a move of God, and they're the ones leading this revival. It's going on. Listen, last night, last night, they had over 10,000 people on the campus of that college. They had four auditoriums filled with overflow and the line to get into one of them was three quarters of a mile long and people were worshiping while they're in line. <laughs> people are coming from all over and, and you might think, well, why do we need to go to places where you know there's revival and there's outbreaking? I'll tell you why. It's the same reason why we go to Chick-fil-A. It's because we're hungry. Because yeah, you got food at home, but I want some of that. And we've heard about revivals, we've read about revivals and outpourings of the Holy Spirit that God moved sovereignly in generations and first and second great awakenings and the Cane Ridge revivals and the Azusa Street revival of the early 1900s and the latter rain outpouring in Hebrides and Scotland and in Argentina. And I've read all of these revivals, but how many of us have prayed to prayer, God, do it in our day. So the question is, what do you do when God comes? What do you do when God comes? When it's not just in a book. What do you do when God literally tears open the veil between his world and ours? And he steps into ours and makes himself known. What do you do when that happens? How do you respond to that? I'm going to have you turn in your Bible in just a moment. You can turn there now if you want to, Zechariah chapter 10. But before we get there, uh, I want to read something to you, and I'm going to be very vulnerable with you as your pastor. I'm going to put my glasses on because <laughs> I can't read without them. But I want to read to you a prophetic word that was given to our church in January 18th, 2006. We've held on to this word for years. And it was given to us by a, a prophet, a man named Lance Wallnow. And Lance came to our, our church in 2006. He, it was a Wednesday night. And this is what he prophesied over our church. He said, this is a house that has been set apart and designated to be a city on a hill so that others can see and observe the faithfulness of God through you. This is a house of miraculous provision, where God says you will move beyond the limitations of the population and of the resources of your own congregation, that God will give you access to whatever you need to cause the dream that is in your heart to be made manifest. In order that dreamers could be inspired and come from the north, the south, the east, and the west, because there are young people whose minds are being shaped and contested for and intended for and even wrestled over in school, colleges, and universities. And in this area, you will have a covering that will cover the intellectual, emotional, spiritual cultivation of a whole generation of young people who will come here to experience a fresh move of God, a fresh visitation. Do not be afraid to stand in line and look foolish. Do not be afraid to hunger so much that you don't have a vehicle, but you're in line waiting nonetheless to try to get fed. The Lord says, if you 
will hunger and thirst after that which doesn't exist. I will give you what everyone else wants but doesn't have, which is a place where a portal of heaven will be opened and God's power will be present conspicuously and consistently on the earth. This place is set apart to be a tabernacle of David, a place where day and night youth will come in and go out, youth will come in and go out. This will become like, it will be like, what have you done to my church? They're wrecking my church. Selah. <laughs> but God says, let the church be wrecked if it builds the kingdom. We're so addicted to our own expectations to what things are gonna look like. What if God shows up and has something bigger than what you've got planned? What happens if God's got plans that are bigger than the plans that you've got? What happens if God has a vision that's so much bigger than the vision that you've got? That it's like everything else he's ever done. You're aiming for one thing and God's got bigger plans. Build the house that will take the territory. Build the house that will touch the government. Build the house that will speak to professors and teachers. Build the house that will have musical excellence and entertainment and value. Build the house that will restore families and you'll be a pastor to the city and not just a congregation. And he'll give you businessmen and businesswomen who will say, this is a different kind of enterprise than I thought in Jesus' mighty name. <clears throat> so in light of what was going on in Asbury, I was stricken with a terrible case of FOMO. <laughs> Sitting in a lawn chair, Jane will testify to it. I, was, I read three books on the Asbury revival while I was sitting there <laughs> because I couldn't get there. All my friends are like, we're driving down, we're going there, we're all night long, we're waiting in line, and I'm getting pictures from Asbury, and literally in my heart, I'm like, oh Lord, I've prayed for this all my lifetime. And I'm not there. John Tyson's like, mate, it's amazing. <laughs> when I hear them preach, it's how I feel in my heart. I'm like, yeah. And then on, I don't know what day it was this last week, early in the week, our RSM students loaded up the van. Pastor Toby and his team decided, you know what? We're going to send a team down. We're just going to drive all night long. They drove all night long and got to Asbury, got in, which is a miracle. And uh, Gage, one of our young students, actually got interviewed. And Gage, I want you to come on up here, quick. Come on up here, everybody. Come on, welcome Gage. And I want Gage to just share with you quickly his experience, how that all went down. How you doing? I'm good. good. How are you? Good, take that. Uh. I wrote it down, okay. so. Uh, good morning, family. <laughs> My name's Gage, as you just heard. It's good to meet you guys if I haven't met you. And I'm here today to testify of the faithfulness of our merciful God and on the prayers of the saints. This past week has been a week I'll remember and have burned in my heart for the rest of my life. And I hope this testimony gives you faith for just how good our God is. This week can be described simply in one word, holy. This week has been set apart other than, than any other week in my life. And I believe it's a turning point in God's story and a tipping point in history. It began on Sunday night when me and my best friends decided to drive to Asbury College in Kentucky because we heard a revival broke out. Six hours later, we found ourselves in that chapel. And if I could tell you what the experience was, it was the simplicity of his presence, the centrality and the purity of Jesus. And his presence brought old and young together. Olds running to the altar in desperation. The young crying out and giving up everything to behold him. Authentic and true repentance. 
relationships and families restored, marriages restored as they got up and repented. The sick healed and true restoration for the saints as we sat in our king's presence. A prophetic picture my friend had to help frame what Jesus is doing. The man of war is tired of a church and our nation being stagnant, a dead stream. And God poured out his presence in Asbury to stir a whirlpool. And he brought colleges, campuses from all over, saints young and old, from all over the world to be sent out to cause whirlpools of his divine, holy disruption to the hour we're in. So no matter where you go, you can't help but be pulled into the center because his desire is to save a generation for the church to come alive. And to save the nations. Do you believe he's here? Because Jesus is here. And he's ready for our response. And I speak faith, life, and hope to you today. That what was possible there. And if you have simple faith. And a desperation cry in your heart today. God is ready to do it here. God said he's going to pour out his spirit in these last days. God said if we humble ourselves and seek him and pray, he would heal our land. And I'm here as a living testimony to tell you here today, his spirit is on the way. Revival is on the way. The restoration of the church is on the way. Healing for the land is on the way. A generation reached with salvation is on the way. As we have gathered for 70 hours in the prayer room, we have seen souls saved, healings, people from all over flooding for the simplicity of God is with us. Church, he has heard our prayers and he is ready to pour his spirit out. The question I have and leave with you today is are you ready when God comes? And will you be a part of it? My prayer for you today is to not let offense, apathy, or pride keep you from the fullness of what God is doing in this hour. Church, it's time to wake up. The king is coming. Are you ready? What does it mean when God comes? Jonathan Edwards, who was a great revivalist during the first great awakening in America, probably America's greatest theologian that had ever produced, described revival or outpouring or whatever you want to call it as an extraordinary and unusual season when God visits his people. And that is what I believe we're seeing the beginnings of. And it's what we're beginning to experience even here on a local level. This is not a reaction to Asbury. I want to say that. I've had several people ask me, is this, you know, Pastor Lee, what do you think of this? And is this us saying, hey, we, you know, it's happening there. Let's make it happen here. This, church, this, this has been happening in Radiant in, in a progressive way over the last couple of years. But even the beginning of this year, as we started our season of Seek, we sensed on January 8th the beginning of something shifting. We had standing room only overflow services, packed out prayer meetings, more people engaged in fasting and prayer, more people responding to altar calls in salvation and healing and repentance than we have ever experienced before. And it was, it was like God dropped it on us, and I joked as soon as... Seek was over. It's like now we're starting Seek 344. But it's true. 
because God is visiting his church. And it's not just in Asbury. Since Asbury's begun, it's spread to like 10 other campuses. Churches are beginning to, it's like these little geysers are popping up all over the place where God's just like, oh, you've, to the enemy, he's like, oh, you're, you're gonna worship the devil on the Grammys? Oh, you, or you're gonna erect altars to abortion in Times Square? Oh, you're gonna write off an entire generation and you're gonna think, and you're gonna gloat that you've stolen them? Watch what I do when I just pop a couple holes here and here and here. God will not share his glory with another. He will not share his glory with a human. He will not share his glory with the enemy. He will not allow a generation to be mocked. God is moving. God is visiting his church. And he's coming to renew and to awaken our hearts once again. Beyond the malaise, beyond the apathy, beyond the indifference, beyond the status quo, church as usual, get in and get out and go back to real life and that's fairy tale and this is real life. No, he's speaking to a generation that has experienced nothing but spiritual bankruptcy and he's like, I'm gonna pour out my reign of my presence on my church once again. I'm gonna awaken my people once again. This is what he's doing. So our prayer meeting that began 8 a.m. on Thursday morning just finished up a couple hours ago so that we could have church in our downtown location. But it, has, it burned for over 60 hours all night, all day, led primarily by our, our School of Ministry and School of Worship students. Last night I went up into the prayer meeting thinking, oh, it'll, I'll have a little room maybe to get into the front row where I typically sit at nine or at eight. And there was 200 people in the prayer room and a 13-year-old girl leading worship and prophesying over the room. I walked outside to get a breath of fresh air. There was prayer meetings in front of the building, prayer meetings in the hallway. I went into a room that I thought was a green room, had snacks, there was a prayer meeting there. There was even a prayer meeting in the bathroom. I don't know how that works. <laughs> and it went all night long. It's like God just dumped something, expectation, holy zeal, holy expectation, and lit the match. And we want to respond to that. We want to respond to that. We just don't want to throw up our hands and go, oh, this is really cute. And we want to say, Lord, when you come, here's what it is. It's you visiting your people. This is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our church that we've prayed for for many years that God has spoken over. And we want to lean into that. And so a couple of the things just to do some family business. Tonight, we're, we've We've canceled our Be Radiant class and other events that we have tonight. We are having a spontaneous, uh, call it whatever you want, service at 6 p.m. So whatever location you are at, Richland at 6 p.m., come. We don't have any script. We're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to testify. We're going to trust the Lord to move. And if you're hungry, come. At 6 p.m., I don't know what more you got to do. The Chiefs won the Super Bowl. There's no other place that we need to be than together in the place of his presence, ministering to the Lord. The other thing that we're going to do is over the, uh, we're just kind of taking this day by day, but we're going to, uh, our, our prayer meetings are going to start back up. And as long as there's life in it, we're just going to let them burn. And so they're going to be open. We had people from Ontario, Canada. We had people from Arkansas, Kansas City, uh, North Carolina, who have come in this week, who have just come to be in our prayer room. So, I mean, we're just, we don't even know. We're just, we're just going to pray. This is what God's called us to. It's that tabernacle of David calling. And so we're just going to steward it. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do the best that we can to put our sail up and let God blow us in the direction that he wants to. And, and we're going to listen to that. And our leadership is very tuned into that. I want you to know that. Because this, listen, this is, this is us standing before the burning bush. And when you do that, you take your shoes off. It's not normal. Nothing wrong with shoes, but this is not normal. So we turn our eyes to what God is doing, and we take our shoes off, and we draw near, because I believe God has even more for us. He has more for us, and that's what I want to just take the next few moments, draw your attention to Zechariah chapter 10. You guys are probably there waiting for me, but 
Zechariah chapter 10 says, Ask for rain from the Lord in the season of the latter rain. From the Lord who makes the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain to everyone, the vegetation in the field, for the household gods utter nonsense, and the diviners see lies. They tell false dreams, and they give empty consolation, and therefore the people wander like sheep, and they are afflicted for a lack of a shepherd. Zechariah exhorts the people of Israel to ask God for rain in the seasons of rain. And I will just say that what we are experiencing, we find ourselves, you are in living in a time when God is beginning to pour his rain out. We have, we have dear saints that are part of this church that have grown up and been a part and been impacted by revivals of the past. We have a 92-year-old woman, Krista Kennedy, my assistant, her grandmother, who's been a longtime member, her and her husband, were, before he went home to be with the Lord, were longtime members. And she's at home watching, but she told Krista, remind Pastor Lee that he carries a, a mandate for revival. Our family was impacted by revivals in our younger years that have changed the trajectory of our families. Do you know how blessed we are to be living in a season of rain? You may not even know it. You might be like, I've never heard of any of this. No, there are times where God visits a generation in a profound way. He makes himself known. He's always present, yes, but there's times when God makes himself manifestly present. When he comes and he walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, when he reveals himself to a man named Abram and Ur of the Chaldees, when he fills the temple with his glory, when he showed up in the temple, when he filled the upper room with his fire and with his presence. Those are seasons of rain. And the Bible tells us that in the season of rain, ask the Lord for rain. Rain is the refreshing of the Lord. Rain is what we long for when Drought has scorched the earth and it's cracked the soil and it's packed it down and nothing grows and nothing lives. All you see is a remnant of what used to be. But it's amazing if you've ever seen the desert. When it rains in the desert, there's a bloom that happens immediately because the seeds are under the surface. They're just waiting for the seasons of rain. The Radiant Church, I believe that in our lives and in this city and in this generation, there are seeds that have been sown. There are seeds of destiny, calling, zeal, connection with the Lord, healing in marriages, prodigals coming home that don't even look obvious on the surface and we might have even forgotten about. But it just takes one moment in a season of rain for that water to activate those seeds and for there to be a massive bloom that takes place. And God says, ask me for rain. Ask me for rain. I'm the Lord who makes the storm clouds, and I will give showers to everyone, the vegetation in the field. And here's why we need it so desperately. We need it so desperately because, as it says in verse number two, the household gods, the idols, utter nonsense. Why do we need revival? Because we are living in a generation where our culture's household idols have failed us. They've left a generation wandering like sheep without a shepherd. No leadership. No foundations. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death among Gen Z. We've seen since 1960, divorce rates quadruple. The nuclear family decimated. We've seen the household idols of our generation speak nonsense. Gaslighting an entire generation about their identity. A boy can be a girl, a girl can be a boy, and there's 50 or 70 different genders. Household idols speaking nonsense. We call what's wrong right, and we call what's right wrong and dangerous. We've been divided by demonic principalities and powers in our culture, dividing the church along color lines and denominational lines. We've allowed war to go from something that happens over there to something that's happening in our own streets. And we've submitted to a counterfeit Jesus. 
A Jesus who is more concerned with our own comfort than his holiness. A Jesus that looks like us, talks like us, thinks like us, agrees with us. A counterfeit religion, a counterfeit faith. A woke religion where the high priests are the public school educators and writers of our curriculum who have put teachers who love Jesus in a position where you either teach things that are contradictory to your faith or you lose your job. We've got our own kids ministry called drag shows where we prep our kids to become part of this woke religion and you either wave the flag or you're going to be excluded and exiled. I'm saying some things that you might get upset about. I don't care. I stand before a holy God. We've sacrificed our children on the altars of convenience. We've erected altars and idols to things that are shameful. We've bowed our knee before the religion of screens instead of gazing on the face of the one who gave his life on the cross for our sins. We've laughed in the face of decimation of an entire generation. And we've been comfortable about it. And in the midst of that, God says to the church, I want to remove your dullness of hearing and even more than your dullness of hearing. I want to circumcise your hearts and remove the dullness of caring. See, the opposite of love is not hate. <laughs> the opposite of love is indifference. We just don't care. Just let me live my life. Let me go along my motions. Let me keep my secret household idols. My pleasure. My truth. My choice. My body. My identity. My comfort. My dreams. These are our household idols. And it, it, was, it would be one thing if it's only out there. But it's seeped into the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying to the church, ask me for rain. Because those things, they utter lies. They're telling false dreams. And all they have to offer is empty consolation, church. Empty consolation. They cannot comfort you. They cannot give you what you long for. They cannot satisfy you. They cannot tell you who they are. The only person in the universe who can tell you and answer the question of who you are is the one who made you. His name is Jesus. The only person who has the right to say my truth is Jesus. The only person who has a right to comfort but gave it up for the crucifixion on the cross is Jesus. Our bodies are not our own. They were bought with a price. We belong to Jesus. And listen, if we think we're going to live our whole lives and just skate on into an eternity shaped more like Hollywood than the Bible and just go on into our little heavenly realities and spend eternity in a good place because after all, all people are good, then we have been deceived by the spirit of this age because make no mistake about it, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But every one of us, are going to give an account before Jesus for our lives. Every single one of us, lost or found, is going to step into eternity, and we're either going to spend eternity in heaven, not because of our good works, but because we've submitted our lives to Jesus for real, or we're going to go into an eternity of separation from God and torment in hell, where forever and ever and ever, we will think back on the moments and this small little life like a vapor, where we had an opportunity to submit our lives to Jesus, but in our pride, we said no. I want you to know I, I've cried so many tears. Over this generation who don't know the right hand from their left, who've never encountered Jesus like I did as a 12 year old kid, spared my life. <coughs> it was the mercy of God. And I look at what's going on in 65 million 
Gen Z Americans and millennial American kids who are being caught in the crossfire of a spiritual war at the end of the age. And we get upset about their questions and their responses. They're just looking for the one. They don't even know who it is. They're just looking for him. And they've not found a place in the father's house. You know, you read the story of the prodigal son. And it says that he came to his senses. And he said, I'll go back to my father's house. For I had it better in my father's house than I do as a slave. What do you do with a generation, though, that wakes up in the pig pen and has never been in the father's house and doesn't know where to go? We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to be the church, to be the people of God. We have a responsibility. We owe the next generation an encounter with the Lord. And it starts with us who are a little bit older. Not real old. <laughs> but just a little bit older. To make room. And to celebrate. And the greatest way that we can do that is by modeling it. Being carriers. Being intercessors. Being mentors. Being godly husbands and wives. And it starts with us asking the Lord for rain and putting away our household idols. So that as it says in verse 4, from the Lord, this is how he answers. From him shall come the cornerstone. From him the tent peg. From him the battle bow. From him every ruler. And all of them together, they shall be like mighty men in battle. God in this hour wants to raise up an army called the church. Whose eyes have been opened. Whose hearts have been tenderized. Who are fixated on Jesus. Who are alive in Jesus. Who have gotten rid of their own idols so that they can rise up with, with clean consciences and with spirit-filled hearts and we can lean in and say, God, for your glory. I'm telling you, church, if there is not a move of God, our nation is done for. It is done for. But a man named Jim LaFoon, who I trust, had a vision at the beginning of last year and he saw a vision of Jesus' feet walking across parched America like a dry riverbed. And he says, as I scanned Jesus' feet from the bottom all the way up the hem of his garment, and I began to look at him, Jesus' face was not looking at me. It was looking up in the heavens. And he was asking the Father, Lord, one more time. One more time. And that is my prayer, God. Move one more time. And if you want to move in Kalamazoo, Michigan, then move here. If you want to move in Wilmore, Kentucky, then move there. If you want to move in North Carolina, move there. If you want to move in Alaska, move there. In fact, Lord, why don't you just move everywhere? Why don't you just move in? Why don't you just take over? Why don't you just have your way? In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, who's the prophet, has a vision of the Lord. He says in verse number one, in the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who calls, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean, a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah saw the Lord, his view of who God was, was elevated. Isaiah always believed 
He was a prophet before Isaiah 6. But when he saw the Lord, when his eyes were lifted up and he saw the Lord, and the Lord visited him, he was undone. It's a little bit of how I feel. God, I don't want to miss a moment. God, I don't want to just think I got it all together because I'm the pastor and the leader. Lord, I want to see you high and lifted up. I want to see you in the way that my heart becomes undone and I realize I'm a man of unclean lips. And, my, and the people and the nation and the culture were a people of unclean lips. And I want God to set the coal from the altar of heaven on my lips and on my life and on our lives, marking us with the searing reality of his presence so that we're never the same. So that we respond like Isaiah did when the Lord touched his lips. He said, when God said, who will go for us? Who will go? Who will go and tell them? Isaiah's response was, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. I think Jesus is looking at cities like Kalamazoo and churches like Radiant and hundreds of thousands of others and schools like Asbury and people like us. And he says, I'm gonna send a little rain just so you know I'm here. Now ask me. Ask me for rain. Ask me for more. Ask me for more. It's real. I'm here. I can do it. And he's waiting to see how we'll respond. Will we just, oh, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. Great. Now let's get back to regularly scheduled programming. Or are we going to say, I see the spots on the windshield. Father, send the rain. I believe I'll drop everything. I'm expectant. God, send the rain. And will we respond like Isaiah? Who he says, Lord, he repented. He said, Lord, forgive me. Touch me. His two responses were repentance and intercession. That's our two responses. So what does this mean? It means God's moving. What is this? It's an unusual and extraordinary season of God's visitation on this house and in this city and in this generation. How do we respond? Two ways. The second way is be willing to say, God, send rain and send me. But the first way precipitates the second, which is repentance, which is God. I've held you in too low a position in my life. Forgive me. Father, I have idols. I have idols in my life. They've lied to me. They've given me a false sense of comfort. False dream I've been living for. And it's left me leaderless. I've made you too small in my eyes. Oh God, forgive me. And this morning, I, I came into this morning asking, Lord, what do you want? And this morning, he just simply wants you. He wants us to turn our face to Jesus. I'm going to invite the musicians if they would come. And I want all of us to stand to our feet. This morning, if you are here or at Portage or even downtown, and I'm not going to give a 50 angle description of what I mean when I say saved. I don't want to have to break it down. 
Here's how I will describe it. If you're here and you know you're not right with God, like if today you stood before Jesus and this was your last day and you stood before Jesus and you gave an account for your life, you, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about going to church, growing up in church. I'm talking about you're not right with God. Today's the day. This is it. If you can't do it today, I don't know what day you can do it. Your heart will be hardened. You may be here and you have never, ever had a moment where you said, Jesus, for real, save me. I am a man of unclean lips. I'm a man with a hard heart. I'm a man with sinful obsessions and idols of my own. God, it is wrong. I am sorry. Forgive me. I want you. If you've never done that today, you do that. Today, if you are a prodigal and you have a history with God, you have a history of being zealous for the Lord, but you've gotten swept up in the idols of this culture and the things of this world and the lies of the devil, the lies of your own passions and your own desires, and you, like the prodigal son, are a long ways from the Lord, today it's time for you to come home. Today, with every head up, every eye open, and everybody looking around, if you know you're not right with God, I want you to raise your hand. Say today, Jesus, save me. Today is the day of salvation. You're not right with God. You raise your hand right now. You just say, Jesus, save me. Keep your hands up. I'm, we're going to wait because there's more. You know it. You're believing lies right now. If you've not raised your hand, you raise your hand. You say, today I need to get my life right with God once and for all. Jesus, save me. Save me. Save me. Save me. You can put your hands down. If you did not raise your hand, but you know you need to. And there's like this weight on your hands. It's like, I can't do this. You're considering the cost. Today, I want to challenge you, break free from the, the chains of the enemy who's lying to you right now. <clears throat> if you know you should have just 30 seconds ago raised your hand, but there's like shame, and I don't know how I'm going to do this, and it's costing too much. It's going to cost you everything, but you get Jesus. If you not raised your hand, you did not raise your hand, but you know you should have raised your hand right now, be free in Jesus' name to raise your hand. Raise your hand if that was you. Thank you. Come on. Yes. Come on. Who else? Who else would be so bold? Who else would be so bold to say yes? If you raised your hands for either one of those, I want you to get out of your seat and come. Come right now. You raised your hand for either one of those calls. You come. It's time to seek the Lord. It's time to seek the Lord. And listen, if you didn't raise your hand, but you know you need to, come right now. Come right now. Come. Come on. Yes, yes. Come on, if you know you need to, you come right now. Do kingdom business right now. Guys, look at these men. Men. I'm gonna wait 30 seconds because I know that in this room there are more. Right now there's wrestling matches happening all over this room. Win the battle. Jesus, right now, we mute the voice of the liar in Jesus' name. If you know you need to come, you come right now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, young lady. Come on, who else? Thank you, young man. Come on, come. It's time to seek the Lord. Thank you. There's more coming. Thank you. I want you to get down on your knees. If you came down here, I, I've never done this, but I'm going to do it with you. 
Church, and let's all get down on our knees to the best of our ability. We're submitting to Jesus. If you can't, please do the best you can. I don't, but if you can, let's get on our knees. And those of you who came down, I just want you right now to ask Jesus to save you, your words. Just say, God, I have made you too small in my life. I have been obsessed with other things. I have sinned against you and you alone, God, but Jesus, save me. Save me, forgive me. Move, touch me, touch my lips with the coal of your presence. God, touch me. Deliver me. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every demonic stronghold that has gripped the hearts of these people. In the name of Jesus, we bind your authority. They no longer belong to you. They belong to Jesus. And I pray, Holy Father, right now for the presence of Jesus to overshadow right now and empower strength and save, deliver and heal. Father, sickness and disease, rather. touch, Father, in Jesus' name. I'm praying, Lord, that as they cry out to you, you would hear them. Those of you who came down, we love you. We're so proud of you. I want you to just say to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I repent of living for myself. I repent of my sin against you. I'm a man of, or a woman of unclean lips. Jesus, save me. Save me. Rescue me. You say that. You say it. And church, you pray for them right now in this moment. You pray for them. One more piece of business. If you're down front, you just have a moment with Jesus. You don't, don't pay attention to me if you're down in front. But if you're out in the congregation, I'm gonna ask one more thing. See, if you're a, a believer, but you know you've got idols and you have personal sin that you need to repent of, and it's weighing on you, it's com maybe it's compromise, maybe it's overt sin, Maybe it's just apathy and indifference. Maybe it's just, I don't even know what it is, but you know it. It's, and you know God's calling you to repent of it. It's time to seek the Lord. I want you to stand to your feet all over this room. And we're going to pray. You've got known sin in your life. And God's calling you to repent of it. And as you stand, cry out to God. Cry out to God. God, just ask him, Lord, I surrender it. And you name it, and I surrender it. Put your coal to my lips and mark me, forgive me, heal me. Forgive me, set me free. Ask him to set you free from it right now. Come on, use your own vocal cords to say, God, set me free. Set me free, deliver me. I surrender it to you. I've made you too small in my life. God, when you come, I want you. You come where you're wanted and we want you, we need you. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. on, do business with God right now. Don't worry about the clock. Don't worry about anything else. You do business with God. If you're down in the front, you do business with God. God, save me. You surrender what you have to surrender. You receive what you need to receive right now. God's moving across this room. Receive it.
Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Come on, do business with God. Take the coal, cleanse my lips. Take the coal, cleanse my lips, oh God. Heal our land, God. Heal our land, heal our city, oh God. Heal this generation, oh God. Heal our land, God. Visit your church. Send the rains. Send the rains. Come on, everybody. Let's, inv- let's take a moment. Let's invite the Lord. Send the rain. God, we welcome your rain. We welcome your rain. We need your rain. The rain of your presence. <laughs> 